good evening. Um, I'm Jasmine Raymond. I have to look up my own name. <laughs> I'm a little overwhelmed um, by all the good turnout tonight. Um, thank you for coming. Um, there are a few more seats left. If you can squeeze yourself around, see if you can find one. Otherwise, you can come towards the front, sit closer. Just find a spot where you are comfortable. Um, because this is going to last an hour, <laughs> at least. <laughs> right? <laughs> OK. Um, again, I'm Jasmine Raymond, curator at DIA. Um, and I'm pleased that so many of you could join us this evening to partake in this special program in conjunction with the opening of Timeline, Work in Public Space by Thomas Hirschen. In 1987, when DIA operated from a project space located downtown on Mercer Street, former director Charlie Wright initiated a series of weekly discussions in an effort to invent a public forum where guest speakers, our historians, critics, and English professors, could experiment with new formats of exchange and discourse with the clear desire to test their ideas outside of the academy. The program was named Discussions in Contemporary Culture, and it had its first curator, Hal Foster. So tonight, 25 years later, we are delighted to welcome Hal Foster back to DIA to reinitiate this series, but in a different way, as a conversation with an artist, with Thomas Hirschen and on a particular topic, the topic of art in public space. Hal Foster is Townsend Martin class of 1917, a professor of art and archeology span at Princeton and co-editor of the Art Criticism and Theory Journal, October. Foster's writing has examined and contested a diverse and wide ranging set of subjects, of artists and of contexts. The anthology, Anti-Aesthetic, Essays on Postmodern Culture, which he edited in 1983, holds an important place in the bookshelf and on the coat pockets of many of us. For in his effort to shed light on a varieties of supreme fiction, he calls them then, of representation and of modernity, he carried through the decades of the 1970s and 80s and simultaneously articulated an attitude and a strategy that refused to go along with the culture of reaction. This culture is still with us. Um, he called it then anti-aesthetic, and I quote, he says, anti-aesthetic also signals a practice cross-disciplinary in nature that is sensitive to cultural forms engaged in politics and or rooted in the vernacular, that is, the forms that deny the idea of a privileged aesthetic realm. Foster's concern with the political, I suppose with politics, is allied with a frank examination of the psychic dimension of art, coupled often with investigations into cultural taboos, as seen in his early articles for October, such as Armour Fu, perhaps the first and last time we saw Arnold Schwarzenegger used as an illustration. <laughs> Obscene, abject, traumatic, the aesthetic of abjection and trauma in American art of the 1990s, Savage Minds, a note on brutalist bricolage, archives of modern art, an archival impulse, and more recently, Postcritical, which came out just a couple of months ago. He's the author of numerous books, including The Prosthetic Gods, concerning the relationship between modernism and psychoanalysis and design and crime on the problems of contemporary art, architecture, and design. More recently, he published Art Architecture Complex and the first pop edge, edge, the first pop, pop edge, painting and subjectivity in the art of Hamilton, Liechtenstein, Warhol, Richter, and Roche. In 2011, Foster was a contributor to the monograph Thomas Hirschen, establishing a critical corpus. Now into Thomas. <laughs> Bear with me. Thomas Hirschen, as his biography tells us, was born in Bern, Switzerland, in 1957. He trained in the School of Design in Zurich from 78 to 1983, and then relocated to Paris, where he has lived since. In the course of his career, Hirschen has radically multiplied the definition of collage 
by introducing common materials such as plywood, cardboard, adhesive tape, and aluminum foil to construct, to construct walk-in forms that put forward a new hypothesis of sculpture and of art. Combining his artistic practice with social and political concerns, Hirschhorn critically examines the dominant discourse surrounding social equality through a wide array of references, from popular culture to fashion to philosophy and poetry. His projects, which build on the legacies of our historical movements such as Russian constructivism, Dada, and Arta Povera, challenges us as viewers to recognize and reconsider the utopian dimension of art. His work has been exhibited internationally in numerous sites and venues, including the Chicago Art Institute, the Renaissance Society, the Centre Pompidou, Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston, the Tamayo Museum in Mexico City, the Secession in Vienna, most recently at the Museum Don da Nais in Belgium, Le Atelier de Rennes in France, and the Sprengel Museum in Hanover. He has participated in numerous group exhibitions, the Biennale San Paolo, the Carnegie International in Pittsburgh, the Guangzhou Biennial, and was the Swiss Pavilion in the 54th Venice Biennial. Hirschen received numerous awards and prizes. Many uh, of you probably know this. He's the recipient of the Marcel Duchamp Prize, and also of the Joseph Boyce Prize, and the Kurt Schwitter Prize. So there you have it like the three gods of the last century. Over the years, Hirschen has maintained a commitment to exhibiting his work both in museums and galleries, but also out in outdoor spaces, in public spaces. So this early production of his work outside it's of a, embodies a certain concern that have endured in his practice and has shaped his understanding, actually, of us, the viewer. Probing issues of impermanence, he employed the French word for precarious, precaire, to argue for a practice that embraced the volatility of the public. It includes vandalism occasionally and even destruction on some times. In the mid-90s, this concept began to manifest itself in a series of pavilions, then became stations, and later in a series of four altars that were dedicated to artists, poets, and writers he admires, including Mondrian, Ingenberg, Bachmann, Otto Friedrich, and Raymond Carver. In keeping with this practice, he initiated a second series of larger works, larger than the altars, that he called monuments. And those were dedicated also to four thinkers, and that those include Spinoza, Deleuze, Bataille, and the next one, which will be done in participation with Dia to Antonio Gramsci. I just want to end by saying a few more words, and I'll be done, I promise. Speaking of the monument, Hirschen has said, I quote, I want to give form. I don't want to make form. I want to give a form, my own form, and I only want to represent myself. I wanted to assert my love for Gilles Deleuze and for George Bataille. I want to form, to give form to this love. And I do think love can be infectious. And it is actually now that I think about it, a love infection, what has brought Thomas Hirschen to the end. Before I hand in the, mo the microphone to Hal Foster and Thomas, I need to thank a couple individuals because a program of this scope um, cannot happen without a tremendous debt um, to a great team. So I want to especially thank my colleagues Patrick Hellman, John Sprague, Rebecca Rice, Melissa Parsoff, Megan Whitker, Manuel Sirwauki, Jeremy Sigler, and Kelly Kiflin for their essential help with this program. Crucial funding for this program and all of DIA's public programs is provided by the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. They are strong supporters of what we do. And I also want to thank our friends at Gladstone Gallery for their understanding of the importance of realizing this mother's project behind me. And, for, and a special thanks to Anna Kowalska, because it's her ongoing support of Thomas' own aspiration that is the behind force of all of this. So lastly, thank you all for coming, and please help me welcome Hal Foster and Thomas Hirschen.
Uh, thank you all for coming. I also want to thank Philippe and Yasmil for the uh, invitation. And I especially want to thank Charlie Wright, who's an old uh, friend of mine. We grew up together. I, I think he was the one who really made DIA public. So uh, Thomas and I will talk for 45 minutes or so. I have several questions and several quotations I want to ask him about. But there are many people who know and care about the work deeply, so we want to hear from you all, too. Thomas is terrific fun, but on these occasions, he's very serious. So I will be, too, or I will try to be. I want to begin with a, a question I have heard you ask others. It is both aggressive and generous in a Kershornian way, um, like a, a gift of critique. And this is the question. What is your project? Where do you stand? What do you want? My project is to, to do a work of art. My project is to, to use art as a tool to fix a position, my position, to use art as a, a tool to encounter the world, to exchange with the world, and I want to use art as a tool to be in contact with the reality. And also, I want to use art as a tool to be in the time I'm living in today. Okay, let me interrupt you right there. You insist on art as a tool, which sounds instrumental, instrumentalist even, but you also insist on the autonomy of form. This is one of your phrases. So how do you reconcile the two? You know, the problem for an artist is never art. The problem for an artist is what to do and how to do. And that's why I use the word tool, tool for doing art and doing art as a tool. Because uh, what I want to do with this tool is, what I said, to fix a position, then to question myself, can this position, can I give to this position a form? Can I create a form for this position? And then can this form uh, be an universal form? And of course, a form who uh, creates something like truth, an universal truth. Yeah. That's why from the idea to work, the work of art, I go to tool, and the tool I use for to do a form, which I think is the essential in art, the question of form. I want to ask you about the universal. I mean, you use terms like truth. Uh, not so long ago, it was very hard to utter terms like universal, autonomy, truth. But I want to begin with our, uh, another concept that is very tricky, but you insist on it in the timeline, and it really is the topic of our conversation tonight. Uh, it's public art. You are opposed to this term, public art. Why? No. To me, it makes no sense. This term, this notion of public art, makes really no sense. Art is public, or Just art matter must fact. be public. Yeah. So there is no. That's why I'm not using the term public art. Well, let me understand what you mean here. So art that is uh, somehow in a, a private space is not art. No, no. Even the art in a private space is public. How so? It means not that for the moment, yes, and you are an art historian, you know it, that for the moment 
I mean, for perhaps 100 years, for 200 years, what, what, what do I know? The artwork is public, but it belongs to the public. It belongs to everybody, that's what I believe. So even when it's not visible, you know the examples in the art history. There are a ton of examples uh, how works were not on view or for very few people, but then get uh, on view for everybody. So that's why I think public art, the problem I have with this term is just because he seems to say there is art which is public and the other is not public. But I think it's not from this side I would like to see it, but more from the, from the, uh, from the desire or from the, from the di desire of art. I believe the desire of art is being public. Each, every art. So if I understand you, the public for you is a, a horizon. It's a hypothetical collective. So when is it made real? Actual. I mean, is it always in the future? No, but you know, this is not my problem. As uh, <laughs> I mean, this is not my problem to <laughs> to to to. Uh, is not. Uh, it is not my problem to uh, to oppose the term of public art because I think. It doesn't make sense, right. public art. It doesn't make sense. So why should I, even why should I, I have to ignore it, I think. Okay, well, let me offer another term that you can revise or reject, and then we can bear down directly on your work. What about the public sphere? I mean, this is a, a term, a concept that I don't think you, you use. Uh, but it, it sounds related to your idea of the public as the eventual uh, receiver of all art. So what, what, is your, what is your hesitation about this term? I mean, you've done monuments to Spinoza, Deleuze, and Bataille, um, but not necessarily to philosophers who are associated with the concept of the public, like Hannah Arendt or Jürgen Habermas or even Kluge and Necht. Uh, so why do, you, why do you veer away from this idea of the public sphere if it seems somewhat related to your idea of the, the public as a heuristic concept, a hypothetical good? It's easy. No, it's, it's not easy. easy. I thought that was a really hard question, uh, actually. <laughs> I use... <laughs> I use the term of public space. I know that's not public sphere, but I use, you know what I want to do is to use my terms, right. to try to use my terms. There are some terms that I don't know, that I don't use them. There are some terms I am not agree, I don't use them. Whenever others use them, there's, it's their responsibility. So why I use the term of public space? I use it because I am a, somebody who makes sculpture. And to me, I am always confronted to the question of the space. Actually, very simple, where to put my work. And this is, to me, uh, why I use the term of public space. Now, you, we can ask, what is a public space. So actually, I thought about, and I think a public space is all space who is not, is not uh, dedicated to art. It's not outside. That all space is not dedicated to art, can be or can get a public space. Even, for example, in a, it's not that it's open all the time, for example, because also in a, for example, in a, in a railway station, there's a public space, even when the railway station closes at night. But for to be clear, for example, a sculpture garden is to me not a public space because it's dedicated to art, exclusively to art. So that's why I, I. 
use only the term of public space. Now, uh, also Actually, because... Can I just interrupt you for a second? Maybe you yeah. could give a few examples because the, the works in the timeline, for example, they begin with pieces that were set in the landscape in Ireland or in the abandoned works series of pieces. They were very marginal sites in a, in a city, uh, an alley or a fence. Um, so these would all count as public spaces in your definition as that which is not dedicated to art. Yeah. And, so, continue. And also, um, there is, it is even possible, I think, and I tried twice, with Swiss Swiss democracy and with 24 hour Foucault, um, even in a space which is dedicated to art to create what I called public space. I still call it public space and not public sphere. Why I have some hesitations, as you tell me, about this public sphere, it's just because it seems to me too, too far away from my preoccupation as an artist, as a sculptor, as somebody who, for example, likes to make the distinction between, between location where to put my work, where is my work, where it will be, in which city, in which neighborhood, and spot, in which corner, between which houses, between, uh, between which uh, streets, you know? So that's why I'm, I'm only using this term of public space. Can you tell us how in Swiss Swiss Democracy and the Foucault Project um, at the Palais Tokyo in Paris, how you refunctioned a space dedicated for art into public space in your terminology. This was, yes, these uh, two projects were projects I made with what I called the guideline of presence and productions. Production, the presence of me, but not only me, of other people every day, uh, and a production of something every, every moment. So I wanted, actually, my idea was, it's written on my statement, what do I want, where do I stand, which is the starting point. I, I, wrote, I want, with presence and with production, create public space, even in an institution. So may, you may say that this is a public sphere. But you must understand that from my side, as an artist, I, I cannot say I would like to do a public sphere, because I'm still uh, interested in, in this angle of, uh, of doing, uh, 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 occupying a place, occupying a location, occupying a spot, and of course then uh, to activate it with this idea of presence and with this idea of uh, production. And when I say presence, I don't say presence me, Thomas Hirschhorn, as an artist, but just s somebody who takes care, who is there all the time to resolve all minor and also bigger problems, yeah. to take over the responsibility. And when I say production, I mean that when I'm there and when I'm producing something, I believe I can, with this production, with this present, I can create something who is not, from, who is first of all art and not a cultural event. It's very important. Perhaps we can speak later on this because I, I'm dedicated to, to to art and not to a cultural event. But with present and with production, I want that. Some, but something can arise which is unexpected. And this is what links me to the public space. You know, I want to uh, ask you a little bit more about this term presence and production because you have used it to distinguish your practice from art that's grouped under participatory aesthetics, relational aesthetics, and it if I remember correctly, it, it came out of um, your experience with the Deleuze monument in Avignon. Can you tell us a little bit yes. about what you learned in that 
that experience? Because I, I think you would characterize it as a fail failure, and you're very interested in the productivity of failure. And out of that experience, it seems to have come this concept. So could you yes. say a little bit more? I'm not interested in failure. I would like to avoid them. But, <laughs> but, but and let me show. Let me show on my timeline. That's also a reason why I did this timeline. First of all, I believe there is no success, there is no failure in art. And especially in art in public space, there is no, never a total success. But also, I believe, never a total failure. So this timeline. I can show you a few, but anyway. This timeline, I made it also to, to show uh, where there uh, failure arised. And for example, uh, all over where there is, all over the time where there I put, I, I covered it with red, there was a failure. For example, hmm. here. There's a lot of red up there. <laughs> so what happened at, what happened at the Dulles Monument? The Dulles Monument was the, fir uh, the second monument I did. And the first monument I did with residents of a public housing in Avignon. And um, uh, because I, uh, I wanted, when I, the first monument was, a monument was the Spinoza monument, but it, in, it implicated only one person, the person who gave me the electricity for the night. So I wanted to um, put, my monument more closer where people are living, and I wanted to implicate them more. So what I thought is uh, that together with the inhabitants, we build it, and then we enjoy it. And then I must, I, I had to see that after a while, because we build it together, and then there was the opening, and several days, and I left. I was no more there, I left. And then uh, several uh, days later, 10 or 15 late days later, uh, uh, the people from the neighborhood uh, took away the TVs, uh, but not to use them, to protect them. Hmm. But then, of course, because they told me, look, everybody, <laughs> there is a big, a big, uh, a big, uh, uh, there's a big attendance of these materials. Other people from other neighbors who wanted, so we take them and took them away. So I had to say, um, that is not more what I wanted, because the TVs I needed there, for example, for the ABCD, ABCD de, de Gilles Deleuze. Mm -hmm. So I, I decided then to stop this. And this was a failure. This was my failure. You, of stopped, course, you stopped the events of the monument. Yes, and we yeah. dismantled it. And mm -hmm. that uh, uh, after, before, before the, the real time. And uh, what I learned that when I do a project with residents, I have to be much more implicated from the beginning, not only for the time of the setting up, what we did together, the construction, but also when it was running there. And you, I cannot let the others take the responsibility uh, about. So that's, for example, one of the failures. There, were, there are a lot of other failures. But look, um, I understand that you were laughing about failures. But look, there is something which really I'm concerned in art and also in con contemporary art. That when there is something we should save is to make failures. Because in the normal society, it's not more allowed and less and less mm -hmm. to make failures. And I know as artist how there is a big pressure also to the artist to present the project which is without the possibility of failures, which must be a success. And I think when there is something who has, must be saved, it's this possibility that art has also a part of failure inside. Yeah. I think this is really very, very important. And that is why, for example, in this timeline, I can show not with proudness, but with dignity, I think, when there were all failures. And of course, there were all my failures, of course. But you know, uh, as I told you, it, 
It's never a complete failure. So I think I understand the imperative of presence, but what about the other term, production? And how do they um, push back on terms like participation and relational? Yeah, you, you told it before. Actually, you were right. Um, I, I was pushed to, to, to propose my own terms, presence and production, because uh, I realized people start to say community art, they say uh, uh, educational art, they say participatory art, they say um, uh, aesthetical relational art, which I was never my, my goal to do. So I must say that I must myself decide the notions I can take responsibility to, because I can take the responsibility and say, yes, I was there all the time. And I can take the responsibility and say, yes, I did produce something. This is why I needed to, to define these two terms. Mm -hmm. uh, you have several different categories of work represented in the timeline, but there are others in your work at large. Um, the altar, the kiosk, the monument, the festival. And I wonder if there are different modes of address um, that you have in mind for these different categories of work. I mean, do they all speak to a non-exclusive audience? I mean, this is another one of your terms. Or, I mean, when do you decide to do an altar as opposed to a kiosk? I mean, maybe you could explain your typology of work a little bit to the, the group here. I mean, all of them are dedicated to a non-exclusive audience, but also every work I do in a gallery, in a museum, or in an in a exhibition space is dedicated to the non-exclusive audience. I make no distinction. Okay. So I made also this timeline that to show myself uh, how, what, did, what, what was the progress, where were the failures, as I already told, where are the constants and where are perhaps the changes or the complexification uh, arise. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, is it, can I, uh, it will be too long to explain this, but just um, actually to me, it's not, um, uh, it's not in a line that first I made uh, uh, the work more outside, and then I, I started with the, uh, with the series of altars, and then I started with the monuments, and then I, I made the kiosks, and then etc. Et so it, it is just uh, that I felt there is a, a, a like um, a, a subgroup, um, an undergroup mm -hmm. that I have that is the altars, for example. And why I, I, I made four? Because I could make six, I could make ten, because then I had to decide for whom. And it's the same for the kiosk, which are eight kiosks, mm -hmm. and it's the same with the monument, which are eight, uh, four monuments and there will be not a fifth one. So this is uh, important to me because I decided it from the beginning that uh, they, because I wanted to reach um, uh, an idea of why, uh, why, for example, these four philosophers, uh, uh, Spinoza, Deleuze, Bataille, and Gramsci. So uh, I think uh, uh, to name it kiosk or to name it altar or to name it monument is of course a classification which is very important to me but the issue is always uh, to make a work who, who is in a precarious situation because they are all precarious perhaps for one week, perhaps for two months, perhaps for four months but they will be dismantled or they will be not more there so this is, the, I think, important notion. The other notion you already mentioned, the non-exclusive audience. Mm -hmm. The non-exclusive audience <laughs> is, for me, a very important issue. Why? Because I felt, not only with my space in public, I mean, when I work in public space, I felt I had to fix it down once to whom I work, to whom I 
uh, to which direction my work has to, to, to take. And this is why on this schema, it's about uh, a direction, to give a direction. Mm -hmm. And because also, I am always struck in contemporary art that the argument of exclusivity, of elitism, is still an argument that is something sh should be very, very uh, interesting. It's even an argument, and I cannot, I, I have to re I reject it. So that I, this exclusivity, I thought I must create another term. This is the term of non-exclusive audience. Mm -hmm. And what it means, actually, it means that I also do not exclude the ones who want the exclusivity and who are interested in the exclusivity. But I want to direct my work to what I call the other, the neighbor, the whom I don't know, the unexpected, and then the who, who is in what I call the spectrum of evaluation, he is always included in this. The specter of evaluation. Who is that specter? I changed it, Hal. It's spectrum. It's oh, not spectrum. more the spectrum. <laughs> oh, I feel better about I, that. <laughs> I learned. I learned <clears throat> that the, 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 uh, the word spectrum in English is, um, means a ghost, yes? Uh, and I didn't know. Or, want... I mean, a specter is haunting Europe. It yeah. doesn't have to be a ghost, it can be. I think this was my uh, uh, translation error. That's why it's spectrum of evaluation. Thanks right. to you, actually. Hey, don't blame me. Um, but I want, to, I want to pick up on attention in your discussion so far. I mean, you have spoken about spot. And we all think that your work is time and place specific. But you also insist on the non-exclusive audience, and you say that you do not want to address particular communities, that you're really after the universal, the truth. So, um, I mean, is that a tension for you, or is that only a, a paradox for many of us here? It's a paradox. <laughs> it's Why? our problem, not yours. No, no, I explain me. Um, uh, I want to explain it. Um, um, the problem is the problem of the um, of the um, the will. Uh, do I do I want to uh, address my work to this or this community, this specific community? Um, and it's not like I'm working. I'm I'm working. Uh, because, and that's also perhaps why I'm, um, I'm interested in, in the world of space, because I'm interested in finding a space for my work. And then, and this is interest me, of course, and then I have to, to do with the residents or with the people who are lived there, who live there. So, for example, when I made the Spinoza Festival in Amsterdam, uh, I was actually invited to do a project in the Belmar in the southeast neighborhood of Amsterdam and in the, in the suburbs. So when I came, I, uh, I did not know that the people there are mostly from Suriname. So of course they have a kind of, uh, they are in a kind of community there, but it was not uh, my, uh, uh, my decision to work with the Suriname people. So, but why then I should not work? With these people, I know. Then there are misunderstandings, of course, and but this uh, and there are perhaps also problems who arise with this. I I believe this, but this is what I tell you in the beginning. I want to I want to uh, confront my work work also to the reality because this is then of course a reality who I have to I have to challenge and have to um, and have to uh, work out. But it's very important that I not. I'm not choosing a, a community. Let me ask you a, a related question. Uh, sometimes you are charged with ethnographic authority, by which I mean that it is said that you voiced your ideas, you voiced your interests 
on the other. And you do acknowledge, I mean, this is another one of your phrases, that you want to implicate the other. I mean, you have a, an idea of the artwork almost as an ambivalent gift that, if given, must be returned somehow. Uh, so how do you respond to this critique? I mean, this, I never understood this. Because to me, this is a, this is a, uh, how can I say? It's a, a, an argument, a cynical argument. It's a disappointed. It comes always from a disappointment. It's, uh, it's what do you, an argument. Wait a second. What do you mean? It's, it's, it comes from the, the whom, who, who resigned. Uh, it comes from the whom who uh, don't believe. It comes from the whom who is neutralized by his own critique. Who is neutral, neutralized by his own critique. His own criticism. So you, you as associate this critique with a position of resentment. No, no. Of, yeah, of but defeat. I would like to develop it. Look, then, first of all, because in, when I go to find my spaces or wherever people who perhaps are agree with me to do my project, actually now in the Bronx, for example. Really, I don't think that I am there an authority. I'm going there alone. The people ask me, why you don't wear sneakers? Why you don't wear jeans? You know, the question is not about the authority. The question is about the competence. And I'm going there with a competence that is the competence that I, as an artist, believe in the absolute universality of art, in the absolute universality, and in the absolute uh, power of art to reach or to create the possibility to be reached. And I'm asking for other competences, for the competence of the inhabitants to give in exchange their competence as residents. There is no game of authority. And it is really, you know, but I know this argument. It's a really um, an argument of, you know, the disappointed, an argument of the whom, who also uh, give up to think that art can be resistance. And why? Why I say it? Art can be Wait a resistance. Wait a second. It's the argument of people who think that art can be a form of resistance, and you think that that that's a position that you don't associate your work with? No, no. Uh, I mean, that to understand that, of course, when you do a project like this, that this will be, this will create resistance. This will be a, a resistance, but not the resistance because uh, uh, an authority came, because it's art, you know, and this is the big deal, because they gave up this part. They already gave up this part. For example, also, you know, um, resistance is also, today, I believe, being positive. Being positive, because when I go to the neighborhood, I am completely positive. You know, I'm going there and say, I'm an artist. I have a project. I would like to do it here. What do you think? You know, uh, look, this is absolutely positive. And in this positiveness, I think, it's a resistance inside. So this argument, I think it's an argument who don't, uh, I mean, I have to pay the price for my work I do. And I'm not complaining. But it is not the argument who hurts me. It's an argument I, know I don't understand. Beautiful. Uh, You've, you know, you just mentioned the Gramsci project, and you've worked on it for months now, if not years. Can you tell us about the process and where you are? I this? mean, yeah, we work together with Yasmil and the whole crew of Odia since a year on this project. Now I am in the phase of doing what, what I love to do, this field work, which means to go to the neighborhoods and to try uh, to encounter people who agree with me uh, to do my work. And this is, and that's also coming back to the ethnological authority. You know, the, the dialogues who I have, they are so sometimes surprising and also uh, unexpected. 
because it's in, 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 its, in its search of a kind of uh, demarche. Uh, so I just would like, don't take it as an anecdote, but this is a point, you know, where I am happy as an artist. When I go there, I met uh, uh, last week, uh, I met Clyde Thompson from the Forest Houses, and he told me, what can you, what, what can you deliver? Uh, what is the benefit for the community? And then I was a little bit uh, speakless, but then I told him, look, I didn't thought about this. I believe there will be something, but I must not, I cannot work, I don't want to work for the community, I want to work for art, and I would like that you are implicated in. You know that? And then he said, ah, oh, okay, this is different than the, our last project we did there. So, you know, so there is a dialogue possible. There is a dialogue possible. And this is beautiful moment, moment you know, uh, with, to me, with a, a lot of hope. Not for my project in special, especially, but just, you know, that you can, you can speak. You know, uh, about, and you can tell them, look, I'm not, so, I, I didn't go to tell, I mean, I'm not coming to offer you a, a benefit, a benefic, beneficent action here. Mm -hmm. Have you decided on a space or even a spot yet? No, uh, no, because actually, you know, this question often arises. Actually, I am in an interface, very critical in a way, because now I met in three different, I mean, I made a lot, but now uh, there are three, they told me, look, do it here with us already. And now, and this is actually what must be, that these people wanted to do it with me, not, not the contrary. But you know, now I have to find out, is this, is this really, uh, how far is this engagement? Can, and then also, for example, an, uh, imp important, you mention it, is the spot uh, possible? Is this, uh, and then, you know, there, there, there will be this discussion about, also, the, I have to, uh, uh, to go again and to explain more my project, and also, no, no, there is a kind of resistance also to, to go over, not the resistance uh, in general, but also the resistance who, who, who are the question, I understand very good, to security issues, to, you know, to other issues, you know, so that I have to, I have to go farther now to really explain my project very, very clearly and to, to try to find what I think uh, the key person, the key figure in, in a way, who is, who says me, I am agree. Mm -hmm. to do it. I'm agree. What means this? Because this is also very important. I learned it a lot with my other projects. When you do a project in public space with residents, you need somebody who is agree with you. What means this? It means not that he approves everything. He has not to approve Antonio Gramsci. He has not to approve a lot of things. But he has to be agree. Like me, I have to be agree with this neighborhood. What happened there? What, uh, what, should I, what, have I, what do I have to challenge? So this agreement I have to work out. I am on this stage. This, this is actually another important term for you, and it, I think it might be ambiguous for many of us here. Um, you, you have said, for example, if I want to work in public space as an artist, I must agree with public space. But when working in public sp space, to agree is a necessity, and this makes the work so demanding. I mean, as I understand it, agree for you means to accept the conditions, but not to conform to them. Somehow. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I didn't mean to answer my own question. I'm sorry. Um, no, I, mean, I can give you, look, <clears throat> every project I made in public space, there was a kind of violence, a kind of. Yeah, there was. Not toward me, but perhaps somebody stole a, a, a bag of a visitor. Uh, somebody was vile, uh, I mean, just shouted on somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, there is this violence. I'm not approving it, of course. I do my best that it not happened. And when it happened, I do my best to resolve the problem. That is what I call approving, N not approving, but I am agree, okay? I am agree that it can happen. 
that is what the difference between approval, so and not approval, and between agreement. So I'm not being the playing the police. I'm not playing the whom who is destroyed on the floor because a, a, a TV was stolen from my project. So we handle this because I am agree with this. Right. This is the difference. I mean, just for the, this question of violence, you, you also say that it's crucial for you to initiate encounters through your work to create occasions. So, you know, when is an encounter a productive one and when is it an agonistic or aggressive one that's not productive? I don't know, even, even perhaps the aggressive one are productive. You know why? Because uh, when this happened, and when then the reaction is not the normal reaction of to call, not the police, but to make the law, you know? For example, to keep what I did, what I did to keep even the people in the project and to tell them, look, we, you are in the project because it's an artwork. It's not because that's not a social project. It's not a, about the law. It's about art. So we, you know, we, there's no problem. I'm not, there is, I, I disapprove, of course, but so even in the negative, I think, what happened, even in the negative, it, when you are, uh, and that's what I try to do, uh, uh, when it, you are spotted, focused on doing an artwork, it helps and it, will, it could be, it can be productive. Mm -hmm. I just have a, a couple of more questions and then I think we should open it up to you all. Um, I want to ask you about another term that I think is very active in your work and it's a term that as far as I know you don't use. And it occurs to me in this, this way, um, I mean, often your projects are quite particular in terms of the subject and sometimes not well known, like um, not ev everyone here might know the work of Ingeborg Bachmann, to whom, I mean, this great Austrian poet, writer, to whom you've de dedicated a kiosk, I think, and an altar. Um, but at the same time, the materials you use and the methods you employ are so familiar. I mean, we all know them now. The duct tape, the plastic, the cardboard, the and so on. Um, and one way to think about these materials and methods is to see them as mass, that we all understand them. I mean, there's a way in which uh, you use kitsch in the way that Warhol used kitsch to um, address not just the public, but really a, a mass society. And you've talked about your, your own desire to inhabit the place of the fan. And I sometimes think that you want to use and maybe turn in mass subjectivity, mass fanaticism to your own ends. So is there any distinction between public or even non-exclusive audience and mass for you? I mean, mass is often a term that elides class, and we haven't really talked about class. It doesn't seem to be an important term in your vocabulary. But is there a, a distinction between public and mass for you in the, in the materials you use and the methods you employ? Um, I never use the term of mass, of course. You never, never do? Never. Never, never, never. But this is not something who, who uh, don't allow me to la love Andy Warhol. But you, I think you told me, you told us that actually that is what I want. Um, I'm not a fan of Lady Di. I'm not a fan of, uh, uh, I don't know who, you know. But, <laughs> but what, I, uh, what I love is the manifestation the, the precarious, fragile manifestation of love people does to Lady Di. So I use, of course, these materials, which I love too, actually, in order to make a bridge, not the bridge to Lady Di, 
or not the bridge to uh, John F. Kennedy Jr., but the bridge to somebody who made this gesture, perhaps a gesture, a very precarious gesture, actually, and uh, which I love, and this, the materials helps me to make this bridge. Mm -hmm. Um, this leads me, I mean, you mentioned Warhol, and I think you know, one of your uh, epiphanies in relation to art came in front of a, a Warhol painting. You said that it was actually painting, the silk, painting, silk screen, 129 Die. Uh, you said, I, I feel included by this work, and I think you said that it was the first time you actually felt included by a work of art. So um, in a memorable conversation almost a decade ago now, uh, Benjamin Buclo asked you this question. Who is more important for you, Joseph Boyce or Andy Warhol? I, mean, I thought we should get one art historical question in here. Uh, and you, you refused his either or, and you said both and. Uh, that you embrace them both. And I, I wondered if you could say a little bit about what aspects of each artist you embrace and elaborate on, um, and if you see any contradictions in those aspects. Yeah, I love both the same. I love everything of both, everything. I love their life, I love their work, and the, la the smallest work and the biggest work, everything. This is why I decide for the both. There is no criticism, yeah, but I don't like his last period, etc. Why I love Andy Warhol? Andy Warhol did, told me, told, don't cry work. I like his frenzy of production. I like his truthfulness to what he ever did, even when he was an illustrator. I love that, I love that Andy Warhol, in this machine, in this crazy machine of production, achieved to implicate so a lot of people. You know, I made the Musée Precaire Albine in Paris. The people with uh, or, or artworks, the only one they knew was Andy Warhol and actually uh, um, Salvador Dali. So back to Andy Warhol. What I love in, in Andy Warhol, that he developed outcoming of something I I, we could, we could uh, consider no, as not so important as the drawings he made uh, to something who I think uh, touches the surface of the society, which I think it's genius because I believe it's on this impact. On the surface, there is impact. And he had the courage to show us the surface and to, to make this impact possible. So I love him and I'm always dedicated to him. And he's to me a hero and he's to me uh, a professor in where I not was in school. Well, what about the professor who was Boyce? That's the, absolutely the same. I mean, uh, Joseph Boyce. Of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph Boyce I love for everything he did. Everything he did, and also about his life. He, uh, he, for example, his materiality, his truthfulness, his invention of materiality, his thinking as a healer, to art as healing, his fabulous action in real politics with the failure also who came out, his. Uh, his work as a professor. I mean, I, there, I think there are no other artists from his younger, from then the younger, uh, so uh, from the younger generation than him who was in school than him who was not so, not, not get so productive. So this way to be inclusive, to to allow everybody to engage, his way to be open for each dialogue, even when sometimes perhaps after. Uh, there, uh, there was some confusion. I mean, this is only to me to love, and uh, uh, this is uh, something uh, I, uh, I, uh, uh, it's very important to me, and I, I, I forgot also the way how Joseph Beuys did always art in public space, and not only in galleries and museums. Mm -hmm. uh, just one or two more questions. Um, 
along with our colleague Lisa Lee, you were at work on a, a book of your texts. And I, I wanted to ask you how your writing counts as working in public space. Um, I mean, you, you deploy particular genres, I mean, some of which are here, the, the letter, the open letter, the statement, the proposal, the rebuttal, the autocritique. Uh, but you also revise these genres somewhat too. Um, and writing often appears in your artwork as well. So can you talk a little bit about the place of your writing in your project? And what does it mean for you to create, as you say, a new term for art to build a critical corpus? OK. Uh, first of all, I, I'm really happy that you um, and Lisa She's took, here somewhere. <laughs> took my writing serious. I mean, they're not the oh, writings you, of a, no, <laughs> they're not the, the writings of a Theresian. They're the writings of an artist, as are all artists. So why I do write? I, I thought I, for, I must uh, fix things, fix it down. Actually, they're not notes. They're always quite either their statements, their letters, they start with an uh, uh, hello, or, and uh, they're always letters or statements or projects uh, with, a st with a beginning and an end. They're not notes, like, uh, that's important. But then uh, writing helped me uh, to clarify, to clarify. Writing helped me to, uh, like the timeline, to look back in order to go forward. Writing helps me to insist on what is important to me, only to me, perhaps not shared by others. But um, and also writing helps me to um, uh, uh, to not play the game of the artist who who cannot uh, who don't express himself. Uh, so I, because I know when I'm writing there, my writings are sometimes, uh, I'm sure, uh, with lake, lacks of, uh, of uh, arguments inside. But it was to me a way also to, uh, to, to, to manifest uh, the, again uh, my will to, uh, to take a position. Mm -hmm. Then lastly, I wonder if you had any comment that you wanted to make um, on two recent and current events. Uh, one is the Concordia Concordia project at Barbara Gladstone Gallery right now. And the other is your, um, your relation, say, at the, the level of form to the Occupy movement. Okay. Yeah, it's coming in my mind. You, you asked me two other questions. Sorry, can I just create um, what I want to do is creating a, a critical corpus. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Why? No, no, I, I mm -hmm. forgot. Critical corpus. Why I wrote it? I think the most important for me is not the word critical, but the word corpus. Because I want to be critical, but I want to make a corpus. And I want to make a corpus which is also to criticize. Corpus why as in a body of work. Uh, yes, a body who is in a critical, who is critical. You know, when somebody is uh, is critical situation, it's a critical corpus. So, but it's a corpus that's important. And of course, I believe all, I believe all uh, ambition of an artist, of each artist, must be to create a new term of art. That's why. So now to go what back. What do you mean by a new term of art exactly? A new notion. A, a new, new notion, notion a, a new entirely form. new concept. Not a concept. That's why not a concept a because I don't do concept art. That's why, <laughs> uh, but uh, an, a notion, a, a, a term. <laughs> this is what's about, I think. But I'm working on it. It's not done, so I'm working on it. Yeah. And no. to, yeah, to your question, Concordia, Concordia. You know, this is what I wanted: is to touch this problem. That how can I, outcoming from a historical fact actually a human-made disaster, mm -hmm. how can I, outcoming of them, create a form who goes behind this historical fact? And who goes, who reach a truth, who, go, who is not related then to the outcoming 
historical fact. And that's why I made, uh, I made Concordia Concordia. And I, what I wanted is to give this incredible normality of a human failure, so a stupid, silly human failure, a form. Mm -hmm. And what was the last question? Uh, your relation ah, okay. formally and otherwise to the Occupy movement. You know, Occupy, um, how can I say? Um, there are two things to say for me, who are not, I'm not in this movement, um, uh, but uh, I like, of course, the aesthetic, and I have to recuperate the aesthetic. It's my aesthetic, I love it. I have to reappropriate this aesthetic, and so I'm you happy. Feel, you feel appropriated somehow. I'm very happy that they are <laughs> appropriated. No, I'm very, I'm very happy when I see the pictures. The second is more serious. It's the form I love, and I think it's important, because these people, I think, made with their bodies, with their bodies, each body of them, uh, an up, a, a very strong statement uh, towards the failure of the representative democracy, which is not more working. We are not, there is, a, and that's why they use the body, their body. And this is something who struck me and who I love and who I, of course, uh, I'm interested in. Good, thank you. Uh, are there questions from anyone except Reiner? <laughs> we'll get to you, we'll get to you. Uh, can use the authority of the microphone. Please. Uh. Yeah, I just had a question um, from Mr. Hirshorn about how you think your definition of the public space relates to the internet and relates to that as a democratic, um, accessible, and at the same time, a space that's dedicated to nothing while at once dedicated to everything. Yes, I forgot. I also believe that internet, I believe also that radio, stay, radio for example, and TV is also a public space, absolutely, because it's not a space dedicated to art. And that's why, of course, that, that is absolutely a space for, to me, a public space. There's a question up here. Uh, hi, this is for uh, Thomas. Um, you describe your work as monuments, but uh, a lot of the materials are very ephemeral, and I always think of, or superficially, monuments as being substantial, you know, bronze, stone, and marble. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? The, the question's about the materials that okay. do not seem monumental, but you call a okay. category of your work yes. monuments. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, because I would like here as well to create a new term of monument. Because I'm not neg negating the term of monument. That's why I use actually in my titles also the, the term monument. But I would like to do a new term. A new term, why? Because its location, because this monument is not in a central place. It's not in, a, in the front of city hall. It's not um, uh, in a place where somebody important actually perhaps did live or did, uh, did work. I, do a new, I want to do a new kind of monument exactly for what you were thinking, that it is a precarious, a time limited. I say not ephemeral. I try to say always precarious, because it's decided from beginning from me that it will be precarious. So this is a new term of monument. But uh, by the way, it is not, it's also not completely negating the monuments, because we know today that all monuments, all also there, were made in four with steel and concrete, 40 meters high, has sometimes a very short uh, lifetime. So, and third, of course, I would like to do a new term of monument in, in what it is as uh, uh, what, what happened there. And even this is not new in a way, because what I'm fascinated, and that's why actually I like monuments, because it's 
all over, because it's always also a place to meet, a place perhaps to drink a beer, and a place also in the layout of the city. And what I would like to do is to put this, of course, uh, uh, not in the dedicated place from, uh, from somebody who are asked for, but in the place where I could, uh, what I called before, where I can uh, uh, achieve to have kind of agreement with somebody, that I do my monument actually there where he or she or they are living. Can I just slip in a, a quick question here? Much of what you just said and, and throughout this evening um, brings to mind the work of Hans Hacke. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about your relation to his work as we search for another questioner. I love his work. He's strong. You love it, all his work? <laughs> I, must, I must say that uh, his work uh, struck me very, very strongly and was very, is and was very important to me. Uh, when I was in Paris in the beginning of, of my work. I went to the Centre Pompidou in 1989, 23 years ago, and I saw his work. I was completely isolated, but I understood. It was like an electrical discharge charge to me. His aesthetic and the information together, this very cold aesthetic and the very cold um, um, information gave, gave kind of electrical discharge, and I was hurt and struck by it, and I understood it happened there. And just go back to the letter, and I was happy. I wrote to myself a letter about what I, what I get from this point. And of course, Hans Hacke is somebody who counts for me, and is somebody, and his work, his, the body of his work is something I love. Why? Uh, because he achieved to create what I call a new form. He invented a new form. And uh, this is uh, uh, why I love him, but also um, uh, for um, uh, the work, which, is, which was kind of, uh, I think for a lot of other artists, is kind of measure. It's called Und wir haben doch gesiegt, the work in public space he made in Graz. Mm -hmm. Uh, which uh, this was the one that was bombed. Yes, right? was burned, but uh, which the, the, in 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 a way this burning was actually a completely um, uh, a completely involving of of of, the, of his of his position and of his of his uh, it was completely uh, it was a response by the way also a confirmation that this is a a point to touch and he achieved it with a form and that. Mm -hmm. To see this, I'm very uh, uh, um, happy and respectful to this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great conversation. Um, a lot of the things that, that you both shared made me evoke the idea of uh, another term, I guess, that I, you may have talked about this in other venues, um, of naturalness, like the concept of organicity and naturalness with work that is outside of places dedicated for art. And even though you're using a lot of materials that aren't considered biodegradable, the sort of uh, precariousness of it sort of evokes this idea of reconfiguring nature and the naturalness. And I just was hoping you could speak a little bit to that term and your, con your ideas about that. Yeah, the term of precariousness. It's not a term to me, first, which is negative. It's not a negative term. First of all, I have to, f we have to, I have to fight against his negativeness, which he has actually today in the, in the everyday politics. Then uh, why? Because precariousness, I think everybody in a life, in a way, feel at the moment, I believe, very precarious. And uh, it's uh, something who I, I, I believe is a, a, a point to encounter. But also, I believe that precariousness is a form which opens new possibilities. The possibility of movement, the possibility of uh, uh, trying to create 
new contacts, new communication with the other, the possibility perhaps to, uh, to be more fearless, the possibility uh, to be more mobile. So I think inside this precariousness is a potential which I, I want to absolutely confront uh, uh, without prejudice. And you know, there, is, uh, uh, there are moments when I do a work in public spares, there are moments, plenty of precariousness that I mean, nobody gets them. You know, you need really to be there and then you would have this small moment of very precarious situation, which are quite beautiful, I think, and which are, uh, can be there because there is a presence and actually also I believe there is a, a, a production. And the last thing I would like to say, uh, and this is more a citation of my friend, my poet friend, Manuel jo Joseph, who, uh, who is so, uh, uh, who I, I like uh, so much. He, tell, he wrote a, a, a history that the problem will not more be in the future that uh, the, the city is surrounded by the precarious who wants to go into the city and to take over. But he wrote in this history, the future, the danger in a way of the future will be that everybody in the city understood, understood there is no way to, to, uh, to stay there, that they have to go out of the city to reach all the people who are precarious. And this, I mean, this is how I engage with this word precariousness. Hmm. Uh, Rainer, be good then. Well, I would just, uh, I have another question, but uh, about the precarious, I just want to say the real precarious people see that differently, and, and I do not want to speak for the real precarious people, but real precarious people, uh, you know, have a real precarious life, and, and I don't think, but the, my question is um, about the people you choose. In one conversation with me, you said that you do not actually care so much about the content of books, but more about the look of books, how it feels, how it touches. And uh, how do you come to choose uh, Bataille and now in particular Gramsci? Like what is it that uh, attracts you and interests you in those writers? Thank you. Take the microphone. T Thomas, take the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. I made this schema here. I made this schema here. And this schema shows what I call my form and force field. It's love, politics, aesthetic, and philosophy. It's also in the map of uh, where do I stand, what do I want. So this is my form or force field. Every work, even the work I do in a gallery or in a museum, I want that it touches not equally, but it touches all of these form and force fields. Okay? So now, to answer your question, not a question of the look of the book, because this is easy to answer, because Emma Kunz, which I love, the Swiss artist, she told us that I can get, she told, I can get the content of a book in having my hand on it. And I take this seriously, Rainer. So look, now, uh, I thought that the four monuments I made are because between love and philosophy, to me, there is a point, there is a, a schnitt point, a point of, um, of encounter, and this, I think, to me, is Spinoza. The total love, the, to the total, the pure philosopher, and the total love of philosophy to me. Then, uh, the second, the Deleuze monument, I put here between philosophy and aesthetics. Of course, the admired from me philosopher Deleuze, but also that Deleuze to me, with his book, for example, Thousand Plateaus, uh, was like a Bible to open as an artist 
to the possibilities how I can engage and how can I make a practice of my artwork. So this is why I put Deleuze between philosophy and aesthetics. And then Bataille, your question, Bataille, of course, Bataille with his, is to me between aesthetics and politics, become aesthetics, why? Because his love to surrealism, his love to all transgressions, but also then, of course, his thinking and his, what I learned, his writings about potlatch, his writings about, uh, uh, about ex exchange, about expenditure, about generosity. So that's why, to me, Bataille is in this uh, here, between politics and aesthetic, and Gramsci, the fourth one covers, to me, of course, the field of politics and the field of love. Because when I am struck by Gramsci, I am struck by his clearness of thinking, but also by his affirmations, which are, uh, which are, I think, making sense every day more and more, but also to his truthfulness to the love of, of his family, of his mother, of the people who surrounded him. That's why I put Gramsci between love and politics. That actually might be a good place to end. It's 8 o'clock, if you don't mind. Thank you.